Council at the U.S. India Business Council. Thank you so much for joining us today on the second part of our video series on the stimulus package announced by the government of India. Um, just a few um, protocol measures as people continue to join uh, the meeting over the next few minutes. Everyone has been muted. If you're joining us by Microsoft Teams, um, you have the option to turn your camera on and off so that we can see you, but your microphone uh, has been muted and will remain muted until we get to the question and answer portion of our um, discussion and would request everyone to please remain on mute until we get there. If you do have a question that you'd like to ask um, it, as the presentation goes along, you may type your question into the chat box, um, which is a uh, part of your console here uh, on the conversation. And I'll just say hello to everyone in there right now so that you can see it. So you can type your question in the chat box and when we get to um, the right time in the presentation, we can uh, get to your question and uh, may reserve some questions uh, in the end. Um, you also have the ability to raise your hand. That's that little hand button on your central console and that can indicate to me that you want to ask a question. But as I said, we will be more or less reserving the questions um, until the end portion. Um, if you've joined us by phone, you can hit star six to unmute yourself when we get to the question and answer portion as well. So hopefully that uh, covers some of the basic logistics um, for the software and platform today and really excited to see everyone's faces um, joining us today. Um, I mentioned this is a two part series. Uh, we hosted the chief economic advisor um, last Tuesday for a readout of the stimulus package on that. And um, I know our presenters will be talking a little bit about that um, conversation since it wasn't recorded today, um, as well as um, I know we have our uh, financial services leads on here, Nalima and Alexander, who would be happy to answer any questions um, on that. Um, and speaking of recording, I should mention that today's program is being recorded. So everyone is uh, on camera and being recorded and we will be sharing today's recording on our social media channels, including our YouTube yeah. channel. In case you miss anything um, later, uh, you can go back and rewatch it. Um, so with that, let me um, welcome our four speakers who are real experts. Uh, these are the guys uh, who have you know, dove deep into the details of the stimulus package in India and are going to share with us uh, some of the nitty gritty uh, details and how uh, certain industries and businesses can take advantage um, of some of the stimulus uh, opportunities offered by the government of India. So let me briefly introduce them and then I'll turn it over um, to them to begin their discussion. Um, first, we have Nikhil Narayan, who is a senior corporate and M&A partner at Ketan with extensive international experience and has advised international corporate clients, of financial of data with and global it. investment banks on high value and often market leading cross border public and private M&A transactions, joint ventures, equity capital markets and transactions uh, and, and India entry strategies. In addition, he is recognized as one of the market leaders in relation to distressed investments in India. We also have with us Indruj Singh Rai, who is a direct tax partner at Ketan & Company. Indruj specializes in direct tax advisory matters, tax litigation, and private client matters. And Indruj has over 13 years of experience in advising clients on varied issues, including invest investments into and from India and on restructuring of businesses. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Kabir Bogra, who is a partner in the firm's tax and regulatory practice group and leads the GST, customs and international trade practice at Ketan's Delhi office. He also spearheads the aerospace and defense practice at the firm and has extensive experience in advising companies on transactional structure, structuring to design tax efficient supply chains, leveraging free and potential preferential trade agreements and advising on tariff and non-tariff barriers. He has also extensively advised on um, and represented clients in revenue and regulatory investigation, investigations. And as a specialist in aerospace and defense, he has advised on export control issues, procedural and regulatory issues with respect to the procurement process and management of offset obligations. And last, we're pleased to have Dibyanshu join us, who's a partner in the Energy and Infrastructure Resources Practice Group at Ketan, 
where he specializes in advising clients on corporate commercial laws, mergers and acquisitions, and infrastructure projects with specific focus on the energy sector. Dibianchu regularly advises domestic and international clients, including government entities, project sponsors, and developers in the oil um, and gas sector, power sector, mining, transportation, and the entire gamut of project development issues in the infrastructure space. So um, we're just delighted to have this panel of experts join us. Before I turn it over to Nikhil to begin our presentation, I just want to remind those that maybe have joined us a little bit late that we have muted everyone. I would request everyone to stay on mute until we get to the question and answer portion of the presentation. Um, and I will give instructions again at that point how you can unmute yourself um, to ask a question. In the meantime, if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the chat box of your video console. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Nikhil to unmute himself and uh, begin today's presentation. Nikhil, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, am I audible? OK, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to I'm just going to share the presentation with you. Um, just bear with me one minute. So, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Amy. Uh, a quick word. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the impact of the government's COVID-19 stimulus package on US and uh, businesses and business interests in India. Um, a quick word on our firm before before we, we dive in. Uh, Kethan and Company, as you know, is one of India's oldest and largest law firms, full service uh, with offices all across the country, Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta and Bangalore. Uh, we regularly act for and advise uh, U.S. businesses um, involved in India and have a long association with the U.S. IBC, and we're very happy to uh, be presenting to you today. So uh, we, we have a lot to cover today, um, and what we are going to do is to talk about the relief uh, package and the stimulus package as a whole. So this includes uh, measures undertaken by the Reserve Bank of India, our central bank early on, uh, as well as the more formal package itself to provide you with a wider uh, range, uh, you, you know, the, the, the full perspective on what's happened in India and we'll take questions at the end. So we'll start with an overview of the relief measures. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the measures taken by the RBI to enhance liquidity. We'll talk about labor reforms. Uh, my colleague Indraj will deal with uh, changes in tax laws. Uh, Dibyanshu will deal with uh, changes in the infrastructure sector where there have been some interesting developments. Kabir will take you through FDI and the defense sector where the, the stimulus package envisages some uh, quite exciting change. I will talk through changes in the agriculture sector. I will then end with some takeaways and then open this up for questions from all of you. So without further ado, let's start with an over, overview of the relief measures. Now, as I say, uh, the stimulus package uh, you know, that's been put forward in India comprises a number of measures. It started off with some RBI liquidity measures and the moratorium, and that was followed up uh, by assistance provided by the government to medium and small enterprises in India. This is quite an important part of the of the piece because these businesses comprise about 30% of the economy uh, and were very badly affected. So there was some relief for them. There was some direct assistance provided to, to the poor and disadvantaged in India. We won't focus too much on that particular aspect in today's session because it's probably uh, less central to US business interests, uh, but it's nevertheless an important part of the, the picture. Uh, there were a number of encouraging uh, announcements and measures as regards FDI reform and measures to uh, encourage investment in certain sectors and a number of other reliefs in, in relation to labor and taxation laws and various other compliance requirements. So with that overview, um, let us let us uh, go into the detail. Now, the the whole package that was announced uh, was approximately $263 billion. That's about 10% of the uh, Indian economy. But that includes the liquidity injection under earlier measures. Now, it includes a number of uh, relief measures for for the poorer sections of society, which which I'm not going to go into uh, here. But it also includes, as I say, relief to MSMEs, and these are the small and medium businesses in India comprising enhanced liquidity through credit lines, 
uh, greater availability of capital, both through subordinated debt and uh, availability of equity through a proposed fund structure. A relief for non-banking financial companies is effectively shadow banks in India and provide a lot of liquidity to the market, so that's important. And some changes uh, to to strengthen uh, discounts, uh, state power distribution companies uh, and some sectoral uh, reforms. So we're going to go into each of these in detail, but before we do, I thought it would be useful. We thought it would be useful to provide you with a roadmap of some of the, the changes. Uh, as regards other relief measures, again, we're going to go into a lot of this in more detail, uh, but they include measures uh, announced by the RBI, include, including moratorium on loans, uh, increased availability of uh, liquidity for the various states in India, uh, and also various market operations where the RBI is providing liquidity to market participants, its long-term repo operations and the like. There's been some relaxation in labor laws, and we, we will come to that and talk about that in detail. And a number of compliance relaxations recognizing uh, the difficulty that, that parties have naturally have in filing forms and satisfying various compliance requirements in a, in a timely manner. So with that, let's start with the liquidity measures uh, announced by the RBI. So it started off with a moratorium um, being made available to banks. So banks who are empowered by the RBI to, to uh, provide a moratorium uh, on loans, on term loans, that was initially for a three month period and then it was extended for six months. Now, this is obviously at the discretion of the banks. They were simply enabled to do this, but uh, most banks have, have ruled this out. Uh, interest continues to accrue uh, during this period, but obviously uh, you know, that is a significant uh, measure in providing relief um, uh, to the market. There has been, in addition to this, uh, an increase in the liquidity and the funds that are available um, to, to various government departments and states uh, in India. And in addition, as I said, the RBI is deploying funds in investment grade paper, so corporate bonds, commercial paper, and, and NCDs. So this is this has obviously created a lot of liquidity in the market, perhaps in a similar way to uh, that that you know has been undertaken uh, by the Fed, the ECB, and, and other central banks around the world. Uh, similarly, the moratorium on interest was also matched by uh, relief uh, or you know uh, enabling provisions allowing banks to provide relief in terms of working capital facilities um, and, and reliefs in terms of asset classification provisioning and whether companies would be faced with the prospect of insolvency which I will come on to uh, in in a minute so this is just a quick summary of some of the relief measures and and the idea here was simply, to provide liquidity to the market uh, at a time uh, of, of need. As far as the MSMEs are concerned, let's dive into this uh, in a little more detail. As I said, MSMEs comprise about 30% of the economy. And as far as US businesses are concerned, uh, they, they sometimes play a role because, you know, a, a US corporation may have a factory in India, it may have manufacturing facility in India, and that might rely on parts from smaller suppliers, quite likely MSMEs. So it's also in, in, uh, in rel of relevance to sort of US interest, manufacturing interest in India, uh, that MSMEs uh, do have relief and the ability to continue because obviously it will potentially affect their supply chain. So what did the government do? The government uh, allowed banks and NBFCs to provide 20% of the outstanding credit, uh, a significant portion, to uh, these uh, MSMEs. Um, MSMEs were also given some protection uh, in terms of if effectively having exclusivity over global tenders of a small amount, so below 26.2 uh, million. Uh, and the government uh, also has made available capital, not just a liquidity uh, in terms of the uh, relief measures, but capital uh, by facilitating about $2.6 billion of uh, subordinated debt uh, and making available about $526 million towards partial credit guarantees from banks. And so by doing this, the, the government is effectively underwriting um, a lot of the credit risk by providing debt. Uh, it's also um, made uh, an announcement 
as to the establishment of a fund of funds with a corpus of 1.3 billion, which will be levered up so that it's ultimately going to be 6.5 bil uh, billion uh, to uh, be invested in the equity of these funds. So through all of these measures, the government has tried to provide both liquidity and capital to MSMEs. Um, as far as asset classification and insolvency is concerned, obviously the key issue is uh, from a banking and finance perspective that obviously uh, banks and financial institutions weren't being required to downgrade and, and provision loans where the borrowers were unable to pay uh, because of the COVID uh, constraints or, or indeed because of the moratorium. And so in that respect, uh, asset classification norms set by the RBI have eased and in fact some of these uh, regulations have been announced as recently as the last two days, um, setting out uh, some reliefs, uh, not taking into account the moratorium periods. So that obviously makes uh, life easier for the banks because then they have greater ability to lend because their loan book is of a higher quality. But also as far as insolvency is concerned, um, there have been a number of relaxations. So the threshold of default was increased uh, 1 lakhs, 100,000 rupees to 1 crore, which is 10 million rupees or $132,000, uh, meaning that the scale of default needed to be higher. And this is probably more relevant again for MSMEs. There was an extension of the moratorium period and the government has basically suspended new cases from being admitted into the insolvency process for a period of six months. So by doing this, the government has created a cushion allowing businesses uh, some flexibility uh, without the fear that they may, uh, may uh, ultimately uh, be uh, insolvent. Now let's turn to, to labor law reforms. Now the, there have been uh, some uh, quite striking reforms and really the effort falls into to two categories. The first category is designed uh, to provide liquidity and extra cash both for businesses as well as employees. So Traditionally, uh, you know, employers and employees are required to fund a benefits program called uh, Employees Pension Fund, EPF, and that uh, the rate was is 12% for the employers and 12% for the employees. So that rate has been reduced to 10%. So the delta of 2%, that saving is available to both employees and employers. Uh, and for certain smaller uh, undertakings that meet certain uh, tests, the government will bear the entire cost. That means the entire 26% until August 2020. Uh, there are also schemes that allow um, employees to withdraw uh, up to 75% of the funds in EPF. So it makes this, this money available to them now. And, and obviously there, will, there are certain compliance relaxations, you know, given uh, the COVID-19 uh, practical uh, delays and logistical considerations in deposit of EPS, EPF dues. Now, that was accompanied by various labor law relaxations uh, in relation to various employee benefit legislation. So, for example, the Factories Act uh, in various states has been amended to basically allow for greater employee working time. Uh, so the working hours have now increased to 12 hours a day and 72 hours a week. Uh, in certain states such as Haryana, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Punjab, Rajasthan, uh, and UP. Uh, there have been obviously various filing deadlines, uh, you know, where extensions have been provided for obvious reasons, logistical reasons. As far as contract labor is concerned, you know, uh, Madhya Pradesh, one of the states, has announced a relaxation where uh, contract labor effectively had to be licensed every year on an annual basis. So that's no, no longer required. So the contract labor can be as long as the, the contract provides. Uh, and probably the most dramatic is in the state of Uttar Pradesh, where um, through an ordinance, a number of relaxations from various labor laws were, uh, were provided for. Of course, there were certain safeguards in terms of uh, safeguarding uh, laws protecting against bonded labor, uh, you know, employment of, of women and children, and uh, certain payment of wages provisions. But this obviously was, was quite a major step. Some of these measures have obviously faced certain challenges and legal challenges, uh, but 
uh, we've seen that it's not just the center, it's also been the states that have tried to provide greater flexibility in the labor market. As far as taxation is concerned, I'm going to now hand it over to uh, my colleague, Indruj, who will present on this section. Thank you, Nikhil. Hello, everyone. There have been several changes that have been announced for direct taxes, either as part of the stimulus package or as part of the budget, which was announced just prior to the onset of pandemic earlier this year in, in February. We've listed these out on the slide, but on account of time restrictions, I will just go through two or three key changes, and I'll be happy to address other questions during the Q&A session. To increase the cash flow for pays, the government has made some changes around withholding tax rates. Across the board for payment to residents, withholding tax rates have been slashed by 25%. Apart from this, foreign entities that were earning income from India recurringly would apply to Indian tax authorities for a nil or a reduced withholding tax certificate. A deemed extension of such certificate where it's already in place for financial year 1920 has been given for financial year 2021 and others can apply for it online. In the event of any default in withholding tax payments during, during this period, the government has also reduced the rate of interest that's payable along with tax and granted immunity from any penalty in prosecution. The other significant change is around the tax residency rules. A resident of India would be subject to tax on his global income. The residency test is based on the number of days spent in India. The financial year in India is from April to March. A lot of individuals were not able to travel out and are still not being able to travel out of India. And the government has clarified that any time spent during the lockdown would not be considered for determining the residence test, especially in the month of March. It's expected a similar clarification would also come for the current financial year 2021, which started from 1st April 2020. The government has realized the need to return people's tax money and issue tax refunds. It is said that the government has issued above three and a half billion dollars of refunds already and continues to issue more refunds expeditiously. One of the key changes I would like to talk about that happened during the budget was the change in the dividend taxation. Prior to the change in the dividend taxation regime, a company that was distributing dividends used to pay tax and no further tax was paid by the shareholder. This has now been flipped where the company will not pay any tax at the time of distribution of dividends, but the shareholder will pay tax. The benefit of this to the foreign shareholders, especially US based also, is that they will be able to take benefit of the treaty rates. In case of US, the rate is 15% where the shareholder holds more than 10% shares. Otherwise, it's 20%. Apart from the lesser rate of tax, the shareholders will also be able to get credit against any domestic tax liability they have on, in US on such dividend income. There are also provisions for tax shelter on any acquisition finance cost in the nature of interest. The corporate tax rates have not been reduced further as part of the package, but they were recently reduced significantly in India during the end of last year. The basic rate of 30% was reduced to 15% for manufacturing companies and other optional rates of 22 and 25% were provided. Companies that were opting for these reduced rates were also exempt from minimum alternate tax, which is a tax not on taxable income, but in reference to book profits and resulted in tax on notional income. So these are some of the measures that the government has taken to give a boost to the economy at large. It's hoped that the government continues to make changes as and when the need arises and as the representations are made to it. I'll be happy to take any questions you have during the Q&A. Thank you. Over to you, Nikhil. Thank you very much, Indra. Now uh, we will then uh, we will now turn to reforms in the infrastructure sector. There have been a number of uh, exciting changes. Where I'll hand you over to my partner Dibyanshu. Over to you, Dibyanshu. Thanks, Nikhil. Uh, good evening, everyone. So on 12 May 2020, the Prime Minister, while announcing his plans on Atmanirbhar Bharat, which is basically self-reliant India, emphasized on five pillars on which self-reliant India would stand and amongst the five pillars was infrastructure. Infrastructure means different things to different people, and it's rightly said that it is easy to recognize infrastructure than define it. With a vision to make infrastructure the identity of India, the Prime Minister's speech mooted the idea of about various economic and policy reforms to promote business and attract investment. Following the speech, the Ministry of Finance came out with various announcements in tranches pertaining to economic stimulus and reforms in different sectors of infrastructure. In the first tranche of announcements on 13th May, the Ministry of Finance announced liquidity injection of 90,000 crores, which is equivalent to USD 11.7 billion to ailing discoms, 
and in the fourth round of announcement several reforms were uh, uh, carried out for other infrastructure sectors as roger macnamie has rightly said we need to stop thinking about infrastructure as a economic stimulant and start thinking about it as a strategy economic stimulants produce bridges to nowhere strategic investment in infrastructure produces a foundation for long term growth and the government's intervention at least uh, now when we are trying to come out of the covid scenario is a welcome move uh, which also makes the economy self reliant and to kick start the entire process this also ties up with the recently announced national infrastructure plan which the government announced which was around 1.4 trillion uh economic investment in structure till 2024 so uh i think this announcement is timely in that sense and the central theme of all announcements by the finance minister was making self reliant with the aim to uh, kick start uh, the stalled projects because traditionally the pace at which the projects have happened and balancing of the risk between private players and the government has has been always been the bone of contentions among the several measures were fast tracking investment clearance to empower good of secretaries and ranking of states on investment attractiveness to compute for new new investment the move to fast track clearance to investors will help in reducing what bureaucratic bottlenecks which were obviously recognized as was the most important irritants further ranking of states in order of investment attractiveness will promote competitiveness among the states and will also serve as a nudge to different states in bringing reforms to different investment policies prevalent at the state level uh, for for the wider benefit of the investor community i think nikhil we can move to the next slide i think i'll just touch upon few of the things rather than uh, going to the entire uh, scheme of things which is mentioned on the slide one of the major announcement has been with reference to the coal sector and to reduce the import dependency on coal sector and to promote coal production the government has decided to liberalize the coal sector which was anyways a work in progress for the last few years and one of the important uh, takeaways has been the introduction of a new revenue sharing mechanism instead of fixed rupee plus tonnage regime presently coal blocks are allocated to bidders on the basis of a forward auction where the bid parameters is the price offered in rupees per ton which is paid to respective state government on actual production of coal and i think the introduction of revenue sharing mechanism will allow government to receive the share of gross revenue from the sale of coal uh, which will be uh, better serving the public purpose as well second has been removing restrictions on entry the government has decided to do away with the distinction of captive and non captive consumer for participation in bidding allowing any entity to bid for a coal block the government has also decided to do away with the eligibility conditions and any interested party will be able to bid for coal block by making an upfront payment subject to certain ceiling and the government also plans to immediately auction around 50 blocks to start with which were partially explored uh in during the uh, before the coal mine deallocation etc happened another important thing is to incentivize coal exploration and allied activities with a view to incentivize coal exploration and production activities uh, uh this uh, the certain rebate in form of revenue share which is being contemplated additionally to reduce the impact of environment due to coal exploration and production the government has proposed to incentivize coal gasification and liquefaction through rebate and revenue share incentivization of coal gasification is also being done with a view to assist in india to switch eventually to a gas based economy if you all recall the coal gasification is something which was quite debated and had picked up during 2011 12 but with the exploration of shale gas etc it had to some extent died down and i think it's a timely move to uh, to couple with this uh, entire liberalization in the coal policy to further explore uh, underground coal gasification uh, which will also aid to the overall gas production in the country then i think the other important Uh, part has been the government proposes to invest around usd 6.5 billion in terms of uh, various infrastructure related to coal uh, apart from coal i think one other area which i would want to touch upon and i think we can move to the next slide is on the power sector so generally the fiscal health of the discom is quite linked to the entire value chain of the uh, power sector and unfortunately because power sector being essential service so there was no force majeure relief per se available to discoms 
even during the COVID scenario, which was prevailing. And then it was a high time to provide much necessary relief to the disc firms as, as they have to honor the bills to the gen, uh, gen course. And at the same time, uh, the overall maximum uh, revenue which used to come was from industrial and consumer segment, which is anyways, because of the lockdown, uh, which has been there for two and a half months is uh, inadequate. So the finance minister has announced that the government will soon release a new tariff policy. The proposed reform in the tariff policy are divided into three buckets. One is consumer right, promote industry and sustainability of the sector. So uh, uh, and, and it mentions that DISCOM should not burden its inefficiencies on consumers and should ensure adequate power supply. The tariff policy will also prescribe standards of service and associate penalties for the DISCOM. Further, discounts will be penalized on load shedding, etc. It's being proposed. And with a view to promote industry, the cross subsidies are proposed to be reduced and open access are to be granted in a time bound manner. That's an important step because the cross subsidies, there are a lot of issues which have been there. Overall, to make the sector sustainable, timely payment to generating companies, direct benefit of subsidy and smart rebate meters are some of the other long term policy initiatives which the government is looking into. And on 13th May, the finance minister, while addressing the uh, press conference, uh, had declared a liquidity injection of 90,000 crores, which is equivalent to USD 11.7 billion to discoms to deal with the existing cash flow problems faced by them and to clear the outstanding dues by generating and transmission companies. And the government has announced that the liquidity to discoms will be provided by way of funding through power finance uh, corporation or rural electrification corporation against receivables from discoms and uh, they're still working out on the modalities of the loan those are some discussion papers and policies of pfc which has been floated one of the important thing here is that uh, as far as the state discoms are concerned they are looking at some kind of a state government guarantee to overall back the liquidity and the loans which will be provided to the discoms so to that extent, somewhat it reduces the effectiveness, but we'll have to see how it unfolds. I think one other thing is on the airports. There are a few more new airports which have also been announced and there are a few airspaces which have also been reprised. I can take those all in the Q&A session and then I'll pass on to my colleague Kabir to take this forward now. Thank you, Devyanshu. Over to you, Kabir. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, if you can change the slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the NDA government has been consistent in its vision with respect to reforms in defense manufacturing. Uh, the first wave of reforms was, incre was increasing FTI and easing industrial licensing norms in 2014, which was followed with the second wave, which included release of the 2016 iteration of the defense procurement procedures, alignment of Indian export control laws with global standards, and um, further simplification of the list of articles which required an industrial license. Similarly, the proposed increase of FTI from 49 to 74% is part of the third wave of reforms. While the increase in FTI is one aspect, the more focused reforms in the sector are actually being undertaken within the procurement procedures themselves. So these two steps being taken together are intended to achieve three clear outcomes. Number one, attract investments for economic growth. Number two, greater emphasis on transfer of technology to Indian industry uh, to achieve outcome number three, which is to integrate Indian companies in global supply chains by buying back more mature products and technologies through offsets. However, the fine print is still awaited on the policy and will have to be closely analyzed as and when it comes out. The initial reforms in 2014 were intended to attract state-of-the-art technologies and products, uh, but excessive requirements with, with respect to control did not attract the large investments that were envisioned. The dilemma with respect to licensing of dual-use products also delayed investment decisions. So while the government has clearly taken a more measured approach this time around, the progress can only be gauged once the regulations and the DPP are formalized. And if the sentiment espoused is mirrored in the detail, then India can actually establish a successful military industrial complex to achieve self-reliance in defense manufacturing. Uh, Nikhil, if you can please move to the second slide. Thank you. 
Uh, I would also like to take a minute to highlight some of the key changes being introduced in the DPP. While most of the changes are self-evident, there are two key points which I want to talk about. Number one, the DPP now clearly provides for the customer to have a right on the intellectual property of the product and its underlying assemblies and sub-assemblies. There is an explicit assertion of the customer's consequent right to tackle obsolescence also once the manufacturer's support ends on the product. This is a significant development in India's procurement philosophy and the impact it will have on future procurements remains to be tested. Number two are the changes in the list of offset products and technologies. Uh, for almost a decade, the list of offset products consisted of an ambitious mix of high technology products and off the shelf products. And this dichotomy resulted in companies purchasing off the shelf products while development of high technology products uh, was limited. By increasing the FTI limit and consequently introducing a more mature offset product and technology list, there is a clear correlation which is being established that greater ownership should result in technologically superior products being manufactured and purchased from the local industry. Apart from these two, based on the last five years of feedback from the industry, several procedural reforms have all also been mooted. For example, a more commercially sound approach to bank guarantees is being considered within the procurement norms. And there are several other smaller changes which are being proposed throughout the DPP, which incrementally amount to a more progressive approach to government contracting. In fact, if there is an audience interest in the same, we'll be happy to share a document highlighting the comparative changes uh, with USIBC for further dissemination. Uh, Nikhil, thank you. Over to you. Great, thank you very much, Kabir. That was very useful. Okay, I'll now talk about some of the other announcements as regards the agricultural sector. So there hasn't been any change uh, with regard to the FDI regime. So FDI in the agricultural sector is permitted uh, within certain boundaries, not generally, but, but as exceptions. So for example, uh, in plantations, uh, services related to agriculture and allied sectors, uh, development of production of seeds and, and uh, planting material, floriculture, horticulture, etc., uh, and various others. So none of that has changed, but what the government is trying to do is to announce measures to improve the supply chain, particularly the gold chain, and the marketing of agricultural produce. And, and over here, this is uh, a very interesting uh, opportunity and potentially one that could revolutionize the agribusiness in India. So let's start with let's start with supply. So as, as far as supply chain is concerned, India's always had certain stockpiling regulations uh, under the Essential Services Act. So now it is proposed that there would be the removal of those of those limits, uh, allowing for greater stocking. And what that means is that aggregation, uh, you know, and storage of, of agricultural materials will be more freely allowed, um, allowing for supply chain efficiencies. As far as contract farming is concerned, again, this may um, be of interest to various uh, US MNCs. Uh, hitherto, there's been a sort of fragmented regime with different regulations in different states. But there is now a proposal to centralize those regimes for contract farming and this is likely to enable farmers to engage with processors ag aggregators and, and large retailers so to get their their produce out to market uh, more effectively so the other the, the other aspect is obviously as far as marketing are concerned our farmers are currently bound to sell their agricultural produce at uh, local market yards but the proposal is to introduce a new central law to provide them with greater uh, choices um, and, and therefore greater uh, pricing flexibility and power to remove barriers to inter interstate trade and to establish a sort of framework for e-trading in, um, in agricultural produce. And so that, that will likely help uh, farmers, but also anybody in the food processing industry because they can buy directly from the farmers. So taken together, although the FDI regime hasn't changed, uh, the the food processing industry and the you know the supply chain and marketing of distribution of produce could see some material improvement uh, and this could be uh, an important therefore opportunity. So 
I hope that's been useful. Uh, we've tried to cover quite a, a, a wide range of areas uh, in a short space of time. So let's try to bring it together with some takeaways. So what, what do we think the government has achieved? Well, the first aspect is obviously, as Dibyansu said, um, you know, particularly in a country like in India, infrastructure isn't really part of a stimulus. It's it's the foundation for, for growth. And, and the reforms in the infrastructure sector are likely to boost confidence um, particularly, you know, providing funds to state uh, discounts and the like uh, may help generate confidence for, for greater private investment, and, th and that can only be a good thing. The improved measures for liquidity and capitalization have assisted MSMEs, and, and that's obviously positively affected the supply chain, so it's likely that some U.S. businesses may have already felt the benefit of that. Thirdly, and this is perhaps a softer point, uh, the government is keen uh, to uh, to welcome investment in the manufacturing sector in India and to make India a manufacturing hub. There's been no uh, specific policy uh, that the government is, is very keen on. There have been various relaxations to labor laws, uh, which, which provides a greater flexibility, uh, although these are probably temporary in, in, measure, in nature, uh, they may provide flexibility, which may be useful in, in the current times. And obviously, there's greater investment um, opportunity in sectors like defense uh, due to the announcements uh, with regard to the FDI regime uh, over there. So with that, that concludes the uh, formal section of our, of our presentation. And we would like to, uh, to open it up uh, for, 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 for questions from you from, from, from the audience. Great. Well, thank you and thank you to the entire team for that very comprehensive pre uh, presentation. It was a lot to cover and I think you guys did a great job of um, succinctly putting it together with really clear slides. I know we did have a few requests for the slide deck as well. As I mentioned, the entire presentation is being recorded so you can um, go back and watch it. But also, uh, we will share the slide deck. And um, if the Katon team simply wants to attach the file in the meeting chat right now, um, actually, uh, anyone will be able to download it. So we can um, also use that as an option. Um, we have had a few questions come through the chat box. Uh, again, if you do want to ask a question, you can type your question in the chat box. Um, if you want to ask a question uh, verbally on the phone or through video, you can um, raise your hand, which is with the little hand icon um, on your center console, and then I will come to you um, uh, in sequence to ask questions. And if you've joined us by phone, you can take your phone off of mute by hitting star six to ask a question. So let me, uh, Nikhil, let me start with a few that have come through in the chat box and then we'll see if anyone wants to ask a question over video. So the first one comes from Mr. Advani, who's the uh, managing director of Advani Hotels in Goa. And I don't know if he's on the line, but he had sent this question ahead of time in case he wasn't able to join us. Um, so even though in Goa the outbreak is rather contained, um, they, the hotels are still shut and so, Hotel associations have been requesting relief from the central government and the hospitality industry, um, but the, the uh, chief economic advisor suggested that we that the hotel industry um, create a demand sort of in the domestic sphere. So, do you feel it's better to give relief? I guess the question is: is what what should their demand to the government of India be? So, do you feel it's better? to give relief by uh, tweaking section 80C, 80D, and 80DDB of the Income Act, um, making a deduction available for those holidaying in hotels, or is it better um, if the new section in the Income Tax Act is created? So um, I'm not sure I, uh, which one of you want to answer that, but go ahead. I think Indru is probably best placed for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then thank you for asking the question. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's it's a good thought to have that the government should incentivize uh, different industries and and address issues. Uh, but looking at the trend that this government has, they are actually moving away from providing specific exemptions to separate sectors, and they're actually that's the reason why they've gone to reduce the corporate tax rates overall. And and wherever the reduced rates apply, the concessions don't apply. So so the objective that the government has is actually to simplify, uh, wherein they reduce the rates but also take away exemptions. 
So uh, this would probably not be in line with, with how the government's been moving in the past few years. Uh, this has been the plan for over the past five years. Uh, but certainly, I mean, uh, you know, these are troubled times and then they call for uh, you know, extreme measures to address them. Um, so this should be something that should be considered by the government. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question comes in from uh, Rohit Dalvi from C3 Controls. What specific incentives are offered to shifting um, investments to India in manufacturing of industrial autom automation products? So is there a specific um, takeaway for, uh, or incentive, I should say, for anyone in the automotive sector um, to be able to put manufacturing um, in India? Was anything in the stimulus package announced in that sector? No, I, I don't believe that anything specific was announced in this regard by, by the finance minister. But obviously, as I said, uh, the government is keen to promote manufacturing in India. That's an overarching theme. So I don't know that there's anything specific that would impact them beyond, uh, you know, the relief for MSMEs, because obviously they, they feed through into the supply chain of any manufacturing. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's, I'm not aware of anything specific here. Okay, thank you. And I know some of the labor reforms that were announced uh, state specific may benefit the automotive manufacturing sector. Um, and so I know some states are undergoing their own reforms in order to attract manufacturing and um, USIBC is certainly in conversation with the government of India. Um, including Rajiv Kumar on sort of other incentives the GOI might consider providing in order to attract manufacturing into India, particularly as companies look to diversify or de-risk their supply chains out of China into other locations, including India. So um, happy to follow up with that. Another, another question um, that, speaking of labor laws at the state level, uh, Jayanta asked, we would like to know about changes in labor laws in Uttar Pradesh that pertains to the service sector. Um, Nikhil, I know on your slide deck you mentioned kind of um, broadly that UP had a, an array of labor law reforms, but I don't know if you can um, speak to anything that is in uh, the service sector in particular. No, I think, uh, again, it's, it's more general than that. What's happened is that there has been an ordinance in UP suspending a number of labor legislations, and there's an exemption which basically preserves certain, uh, uh, you know, more sensitive issues like child labor and bonded labor and the like. So, for to the extent that the service sector, you know, it, it's just the same as anything else, right? So, uh, increased uh, working time, for example, uh, may help those in the service sector. Although it may, may not be designed specifically for the service sector, there's a collateral benefit, but no, the, the changes are more broad range. But what I would say is that, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure the extent to which these are should be regarded as being permanent changes. Uh, there are obviously a reaction and a temporary reaction to provide flexibility to where things are now. Uh, but, you know, there, there has been some judicial challenge uh, to some of these. Uh, so uh, that there may be some evolution uh, in the shape of these uh, regulations and the exemptions uh, in, in the time to come. So there's uh, points out it's not specific to service sector, it's, it's across the board, but obviously um, working hours are a key part of it. And, and number two, because of uh, judicial challenge and also frankly because these are intended to be temporary measures, there may be evolution over time. Got it. Thank you. Uh, another question came in from Ramesh Deshpande. Uh, do Indian banks have the organizational capacity to quickly respond to the MSME um, needs in terms of restructuring the old loans and extending new loans? So I think this is a little bit more um, outside the scope of the stimulus, but sort of or structurally, even with the reforms or the stimulus that the GOI has announced, you know, what is your thinking in terms of the ability of the banks to respond to this? And Ramesh, I see you on the screen. So if there's anything else you want to add to that, uh, feel free to take yourself off of mute. Otherwise, Nikhil, I'm not sure um, who might take that. I can I can deal with this. Um, you know, the, as far as MSME is concerned, you know, the banks certainly I think have the ability to lend. It's just it's, it's, it's less a question, I think, of MSMEs and it's less a question of ability to get the money out there. It's more a question of, uh, you know, the banks actually uh, getting around to, to, to doing so. 
Uh, because I think, and this is a this is not really a legal point at all. It's more of a general macro point. There's, there's enough liquidity in the system. The issue is getting it out there now. As far as MSMEs are concerned, it's obviously a very sensitive sector, uh, and uh, in any case, they have always benefited from a number of exemptions uh, and special treatment, even under India's insolvency law and the like. So I think. You know, it's less of a legal issue, and and so I don't really know how, how the banks are dealing with uh, getting getting the money out there. But I mean, I don't think that there is any operational challenge. I think it's just a question of um, them pumping in liquidity to the system, given that they do have sufficient funds. Thanks. Um, and I want to thank Indraj. Uh, I had skipped over an earlier question about um, what specific steps that companies would need to take in order to um, avail of the lower tax rate. So um, Indraj, I know you had responded here in the chat box, but is there anything else you want to say on that in terms of what companies might proactively need to do in order to avail of that lower rate? Sure, thank you, Aunt Amy. So largely an election form needs to be filled. And, and the government wants this to be an active step at your part. And, and I think what is really important is that you really consider the pros and cons if you're making an election. Because once you opt for the reduced rates, you cannot opt out at a later stage. You can always opt in at a later stage, but once you opt in, you can't opt out. The main disadvantages one may look at per se, or, or say the benefits that won't be available if you offer the reduced rate, as I was talking about it earlier, any special concessions that the Income Tax Act grants, either by virtue of a specific sector, or by virtue of specific jurisdiction, or whether it's a tax holiday under SEZ scheme, uh, those will not be available club with the reduced rate of tax. So these all should be considered looking at where your business is. If you look any otherwise taking a weighted deduction of accelerated depreciation or deduction for scientific research, etc., all these kind of concessions would not be available for reduced rate. So you should look at the needs of your specific business and see are you better off claiming those deductions reducing your effective rate of tax, or are you just better off opting for lower tax and simplifying the compliance? Thank you for that. And I just uh, saw across the wire that there is some uh, small earthquake in Delhi at 4.6, so I hope everyone's safe and not feeling uh, anything. Um, but please, everyone, stay safe. Um, and I, I want to thank Kabir for also responding a little further to Mr. Dalvi's questions in terms of the incentives um, planned by the states for shifting manufacturing. So uh, Mr. Dalvi in the chat box, um, Kabir has responded a little bit more to your question um, as well. Uh, if anyone does have a question and they're on the phone, they can hit star six to unmute themselves and ask it. Uh, and if you're here with us on video and you have any more questions, you can raise your hand. And um, that's the little hand icon on your screen, and I will um, call call upon you. Um, so let me pause there for just a second and see if anyone, either on the phone or on the screen, wants to ask a question. Okay. Well, the, the one thing I wanted to mention um, too, and I'm not sure if Nalima is raising her hand, which is good because I was just about to call on you, Nalima. Um, so Nalima, I, uh, I, I did want to mention that um, Nalima heads the, our financial services committee here at USIBC and is considering um, collating further reforms that we might want to make uh, recommendations to the government of India. Uh, either in response to this package that has been announced or possibly, um, as I'm thinking about it, and this is just me, Amy, thinking about it, if further, if another stimulus is announced down the road. So if there are things left out that would benefit your company that you think the government of India ought to consider, um, you know, if they do announce another set of stimulus uh, package um, reforms, uh, or, you know, I don't think there's any harm in sort of uh, reacting to some of the things that have happened as well. Um, please send us a note so that we can collate those ideas and then put them together. But Nalima, let me turn it over to you now um, so that maybe you can talk a little bit more about that and what the committee has been doing, as well as, um, you know, your work with the Chief Economic Advisor's Office in the Ministry of Finance. Thank you. And thank you to Kaitan for providing such an in-depth analysis. I think it's really important for us as we think through um, what may be next. And that's exactly, you've, you've, you've touched on all of the points that I wanted to ask. I'd like to start with um, a question for uh, Kaitan first. 
Uh, do you see any further areas for reforms based on your conversations and your sense of what's happening on the ground? And if so, where do you think those might be? Um, is the is the question, and I'll start with that, and then I'll also talk about the work that we did to provide input into the economic stimulus. And based on your answers, um, we can also talk about what the next steps might be. So it would be good to hear from you, your thinking on this. Well, it's obviously, um, it's not strictly a legal issue, but I think as far as the stimulus is concerned, I think there's obviously been a market reaction, the market reaction to what's been announced. Uh, and so I think the government would, you know, the market certainly would welcome any further measures, I think, uh, in terms of uh, providing liquidity and, and I think real cash to businesses that, that are affected. Uh, because I think the, the current approach is, is obviously to, to facilitate other market participants to fund. So the financial system providing it a sufficient liquidity and underwriting some of the credit risk, but effectively allowing banks to lend. Uh, and there hasn't been, uh, you know, some of the sort of measures that we've seen in, in other jurisdictions. Now, obviously, there are constraints on what those, those are. So I think, and I think those measures in terms of liquidity are really not legal issues. But as far as greater uh, structural reform is concerned, I think there's obviously uh, potential and flexibility uh, to do so, uh, you know, allowing allowing, for example, FDI and defense up to uh, the percentage, the greater percentage uh, is obviously a starting point, but there are several other sectors where I think, um, you know, reforms could happen uh, and that would actually free up a lot of capital in the market. Like, for example, let's take insurance, uh, you know, there's a cap of 49%. Uh, if that were to be lifted, uh, that would also allow um, a lot of the banks to sell their stakes in insurers or for a lot of the international insurers who are JV partners to increase their stake. And that would obviously have the effect of freeing up uh, capital that could be redeployed in, um, you know, by the banks uh, more effectively or could be used to manage their risk in other ways. So, for example, that's one area. Then there are several other sectors in terms of rationalization uh, of FDI uh, that could happen. I think the government has been speaking about simplification of of the FDI policy, and I think that would uh, certainly be be useful. I think, you know, it, broadly allowing that and also allowing for some flexibility in India's exchange controls, uh, you know, particularly to allow a greater flexibility for financial investors is obviously great sensitivity in terms of uh, certain types of structured instruments and, uh, you know, the question of you know, downside protection and, and uh, guaranteed returns for equity instruments, which has always been difficult and problematic in India. But those are not, you know, and, and they're naturally uh, long-standing issues, uh, and understandably so, I think, uh, around capital controls in the Indian economy. That's a much bigger issue, and I think the RBI has always taken a sensible approach. But I think from a foreign investment perspective, uh, you know, given that there is uh, a need for capital and investment in the country, and that's uh, you know, that will actually stimulate further growth. Some easing or relook at some of that and some simplification of the FDI uh, regime, uh, I think would uh, would be helpful. Thank you. I, I think um, that, that sets up uh, a very nicely. So what USIBC did was when the economic stimulus was being considered, we requested input from um, the industry and companies as to what would be um, important to ensure continuity and growth during the COVID and in response to the economic um, impact of measures taken to contain COVID. And we were very pleased to see that a number of those measures, a number of the areas that we um, had suggested and that our companies had suggested were taken up by the government um, to ameliorate some of those negative effects. The MSMEs is one such area. So as Amy said, you know, this is an ongoing process as we look to coming out of COVID. And the reason that I asked you that question is because this is not a single step, but really a process. 
at a stage within that process. So we look forward to hearing your um, continued recommendations on the impact and effectiveness of the measures that were um, have been currently issued. And we are looking forward to developing recommendations for emerging out of the COVID environment to put India back on the growth track that it had. So um, within financial services specifically, but it, it, it does impact across sectors, we are looking to do a round table and provide some inputs. And I think there is an appetite, as Nikhil um, has mentioned, for increasing investments. And to that end, um, whether it's the insurance sector or whether it's the agricultural sector or it's supply chains, there is an interest in hearing from companies as to what might continue deepening investments and attracting investments. So we look forward to your input and engagement on those issues um, and particularly tying it back to the effectiveness and impact of the economic stimulus measures. Um, and you know whether you contact Amy or whether you contact me or anyone else in USIBC, we're happy to engage you in that effort. We've received some responses to the economic stimulus, some of them very specific in terms of tax measures, and some of them broader, as Nicholas mentioned, which are uh, structural issues. But we look forward to getting all of them and working with you to develop an ongoing dialogue with the government of India um, and the different parts um, of the government of India, whether it's Niti Aayog or DPIIT or the Ministry of Finance or specific regulators such as the RBI to give them the um, the thinking of companies as to what would make the greatest impact in helping them um, not only survive the COVID um, impact, but actually to bring India back on track. So thank you for um, thank you, Nico, for your analysis, and we look forward to working with you um, to provide not just big ideas, but the very specific granular steps needed to to give to give strength to those broader concepts. Thank you, Nilima. Thank you, Amy. It's, it's been great uh, participating, and, and thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Nalima, and I want to thank you, um, everyone, uh, for joining us. I see that the chat box is still active with some questions going on in conversation, and so we will, um, and the KTAN team will get back to you with some of those answers. Um, seeing as that it's getting late in India uh, and it's coming up on the lunchtime here on the East Coast, I don't want to keep anyone from their meals, so Kripya uh, Apne Kana Kare, so that we can all go and enjoy our uh, our food. But um, I want to thank the Ketan team in particular for your really detailed analysis on this. Um, Nikhil, Debianchu, Indruj, and Kabir, uh, really thoughtful and succinct analysis on a comprehensive bill. Um, again, if you do have further input, as Nalima had suggested, for us to consider, um, please do send us a note or reach out to us. And I know a few of you have sent recommendations into the chat box, so we're grateful for that. Um, but I want to thank you all for your support of USIBC. I want to thank the Ketan team for their analysis and wish everyone a very good evening if you're in India and a good rest of your day in the US. Be well, uh, stay healthy and stay safe and look forward to talking to you all um, soon. Amy, before you finish, um, yeah. there is a question and it's one of the questions that I had. Um, it's in, in the chat box and I think people would be interested. Um, Ketan's presentation was excellent and I think there's a call for whether they could download a copy. I know that this is recorded, but I think the question is whether Ketan could take, uh, would be willing to share that PowerPoint for folks to take away as collateral. I know that everyone yeah, in no, our we, membership we, uses we, it. We can certainly do that. I just don't do it right now. So I'll, I'll send it. I'll send it to the to to, to USIBC and perhaps you could uh, share it with the participants. I'm sorry. Uh, I just don't know. That's how great. To... If you send it to us, we will email it to everyone who registered for the program today. Um, so Jahan V and Devika, if I could just ask your help on that, but. Um, We'll definitely get it in your hands, uh, send it over email. And again, it's being recorded um, so you can rewatch it on our YouTube channel. We should have that up in a couple days as well. So um, thanks again. Uh, stay safe and healthy, everyone, and look forward to talking to you all very soon. Thank you, Bye. Amy.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.